thank you all for joining us for Jimmy Carter and the Camp David Accords. Uh, this program contextualizes the diplomatic, economic, cultural, and military interactions between empires, nations, and peoples in the 20, 20th century that uh, shaped America's increasingly important role in the world and set the stage for the Camp David Accords. In particular, this topic will be examined through the lenses of the Cold War and American civics, with an emphasis on President Carter's role in peace negotiations between Egypt and Israel. And this program is led by Joshua uh, Montanari, who's the education specialist and volunteer docent, uh, coordinate, docent coordinator at the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. So all 70 of us or so that are watching live and the many more that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Joshua for joining us this afternoon. And Joshua, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And again, for being here uh, with the World Cup, maybe feel free to put the World Cup on in the background. We'll never know. Uh, so <laughs> I'm here to talk about uh, Jimmy Carter, the Camp David Accords. As mentioned, this program uh, will be through the lens of civics, um, also through our primary sources. Um, as we are a part of the National Archives. That's really our bread and butter is sharing America's records with the public. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Again, I mentioned that National Archives is the uh, managing agency of the presidential libraries. Uh, some things that we are known for, the America's founding documents, which is actually what you're seeing uh, in this photograph on the left side of your screen. Looks like a very somber funeral procession, but this is actually a joyous occasion when the Constitution, Declaration, Bill of Rights, copy of the Magna Carta are being brought into the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. for the American public. Uh, to access. Uh, we do have 40 facilities nationwide altogether, not just uh, in College Park, Maryland, or in Washington, D.C. We have regional facilities, uh, presidential libraries, um, many other uh, places that we're associated with. Uh, about the presidential libraries, you know, there's a mix of private presidential libraries and ones affiliated with the National Archives. Uh, the easiest way to remember is that all of them from Herbert Hoover uh, thus far through President Obama are uh, affiliated with the National Archives. Uh, FDR had the first, his predecessor decided to have one after he did. Uh, now, this isn't something that's mandatory for an outgoing president uh, as far as having a public facing uh, museum like we do here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, but regardless of whether or not they choose to have that, their collections and records from their time in office uh, are managed by the National Archives. Uh, more or less, that means they belong to the American people. So and we manage those for them. Um, but if they do decide to have that out facing facility, it is up to that outgoing president to raise the funds uh, for any property acquisition, construction fees. Uh, typically what happens then is uh, they then hand the management over to the National Archives. Uh, that is That might be changing going forward. Uh, we did just have the George W. Bush uh, library handover management of its museum to the George W. Bush Foundation. Maybe that could be a model going forward, but currently most of the ones you're seeing on the screen uh, managed by the National Archives. Uh, we do have on-site research available here in Atlanta if anybody happens to be down. Uh, we do uh, request that you make an appointment if you're coming on-site. Uh, we do require consultation for that. We have a lot of information available on our website, our safe COVID safety measures and many other things you can learn about. Uh, like you see on the screen here, just a quick shot from our webpage. You can find out our research policies. You can see what collections we have available. They do have descriptions for each one. So you know what you're gonna be getting into uh, when you come to do research. Uh, frequently requested topics, great for if you're uh, any students out there. Uh, doing any kind of projects that, uh, on topics related to the Carter administration. You can get in touch with us online with the form. Uh, also check us out on social media, get us by phone. Uh, you can also uh, check out the History Hub as well. For anyone who would like to have this presentation, I can pass that on and that can be made available to you. You can see I have active hyperlinks embedded here for you to learn more. Uh, but to get to our topic today, the Camp David Accords, uh, we see a very jovial picture here uh, from the National Archives. Um, we see a lot of uh, enthusiastic, happy 
photographs from this time. Uh, we do get a positive outcome, but it was very grueling getting getting there. So maybe images like these don't quite capture the, <laughs> the true nature of these negotiations. They did run for 13 days, um, only meant to be a weekend, turns out to be a little longer. Uh, coming out of this, uh, the big results were normalization of relations between Egypt and Israel, uh, return of the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt uh, by Israel, and it did provide a framework for Israeli-Palestinian peace. So we'll go ahead and look at the contextualization. If we have any teachers out there with us today, uh, or if there are any students around, um, the Camp David Accords really, as we'll see in a moment and we'll discuss is really an overlapping topic. So many different things going on, especially as far as curriculum goes, uh, but a ver vast array of topics. We can talk about debate and diplomacy, America as a world power, um, really looking at America and the world because here's the United States on the world stage more or less being an arbitrator uh, between two other uh, uh, nations. Um, and a big part of it, as I mentioned, was the Cold War, which ties into post-World War I and II, actually. And technically, we could keep going back further and further, but that's kind of where, for our purposes, where we cut it off. Um, but we'll see through the, uh, these negotiations, you really can see how various military and diplomatic responses to international developments over time um, I've, you know, had an outcome here, how those things are at play and how primary sources help us understand that. Again, if we have anybody from Georgia where I'm at, we have the Georgia Standards of Excellence listed. Also have national standards listed. Again, if we have any teachers or students, students in the audience, I'll just click through that. It's something folks can look a little deeper into later. But here again, as I mentioned, um, Overlapping this topic, Camp David Accords. I we have to talk about Arab nationalism and pan Arabism. Uh, again, back from World War One and World War Two, um, the energy crisis, something preceding Carter's time in office. Uh, it would outlast his time in office. Uh, Middle East peace process, it's still happening today. Uh, and then again, the Cold War. Now, typically with Cold War, I know when I was in school, we tended to think about that as uh, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, we think about Vietnam and uh, and the Soviet Union, uh, but it was much bigger than that. And there definitely is a Cold War aspect happening in the Middle East peace process where we have uh, the United States and Western uh, nations vying for influence in countries there. And the same is true of the Soviet Union. Um, and I really love this John Muir quote. We see a great photograph there from the National Archives uh, catalog with uh, him and President Teddy Roosevelt that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched everything else in the universe. Definitely true on this topic. Um, real quick, uh, Arab nationalism and pan-Arabism, two different concepts. Arab nationalism comes from the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in World War I. So that's where we start drawing lines on the map out of that former empire. Then pan-Arabism was unity among those newly formed nations post-World War I against what they called colonial tendencies and imperial powers. So that's how that map we see on the left really shaped up was after the World Wars. After the Second World War, the United States is uh, literally the only superpower left standing, or it becomes the superpower as a result. They're really the only industrialized nation still standing economically speaking. And that's coming off of a Great Depression. Uh, Marshall Plan gives 12 billion in aid to Western Europe again, in, in defense of uh, what they perceive as a growing threat from the Soviet Union. Uh, they also form something we hear a lot about in the news these days with um, the conflict in Ukraine happening, the formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, nations that uh, are obligated to each other, uh, to each other's defense in the case of attack from the Soviet Union. Uh, naturally, the Soviet Union responds to that. They have the formation of the Warsaw Pact. Uh, now, we don't see any Middle Eastern nations among there. And we don't have any in NATO uh, at the time, but it is still in play as far as uh, the Soviet Union and the United States vying for influence. And as they do that, these are things that we would be seeing at that time. Uh, here in the United States, students in school being inundated with posters like that. We're starting to see images coming back from Eastern Europe, like the one on the right. Uh, so the Cold War is maybe not so cold. We do see signs of it being hot, potentially hot, uh, all over the world. 
and also in 1948, uh, I think what we're looking at here on the screen is one of the most impactful documents uh, of the 20th century. Um, this is what it looks like when the United States, uh, with Harry, Harry Truman as president, recognizes the new state of Israel. In my mind, when I think about that, that's something that's you know, a thick volume of pages. Uh, but we see it's just two very small, uh, very short paragraphs, you know, a few uh, handwritten corrections. And that really sets a lot of things in motion. Uh, the, the day after this uh, recognition is signed, uh, Arab-Israeli conflicts begin that will not end until the conclusion of this uh, peace summit the camp, uh, with the Camp David Accords. So more than 40 years of war. Um, and we, you know, we do have a link on the screen uh, for a press release announces the U.S. government's de jure recognition of the state of Israel in 1949. So again, a little further inquiry for anyone that's interested in learning more about this. Maybe how does that uh, compare to this one we see on the screen? I would uh, challenge you to find out for yourselves. So here are those Arab-Israeli conflicts. As mentioned, they begin in 48. They run through the 1970s. Um, prior to Anwar Sadat, who we uh, see quite a bit of uh, when we talk about this topic of the Camp David Accords, he was preceded uh, by Nasser. Uh, we, we see the cartoon on the right, Nasser's Egypt, the camel drinking out the uh, Suez Canal. That was a, a, a bit of, well, a thing in the 1950s where the United States wasn't directly involved in that. That was England, France, uh, Egypt. The United States-British relationship came out of that a little bit weakened. Um, gave Nasser a bit of a rise among uh, Air, his uh, Arab neighbors. More or less, Egypt becomes the de facto leader of the pan-Arab world. Uh, and they really do spearhead these wars that we see uh, being mentioned on the screen here. So again, 48, the first one. Uh, 56, again, the nationalization of the Suez Canal. 67 is the big one, the Six-Day War. And that's really what's on the table at the Camp David Accords, is trying to turn back the consequences of the Six-Day War. Uh, another one in 1970, War of Attrition. This is kind of a big one because Israel actually shoots down five Soviet aircraft, had the potential to turn into something uh, very big. Maybe the Soviet Union could have escalated. In response, the United States likely would have escalated its support of Israel in one form or, or another. Could have been the big tinderbox for a, a third world war. Luckily, that did not happen. Um, again, results in a, a uh, Israeli victory as the previous uh, conflicts did. The last major conflict they have is the Yom Kippur Ramadan War. Uh, again, Egypt and Syria against Israel. Uh, Israeli victory, but not as decisive as previous ones. And it's this one that uh, initiates the Arab oil embargo in the United States. And that is what sets a lot of things in motion uh, that affect the Carter administration and subsequent administrations. Uh, that's really what sparks the energy crisis uh, as far as the United States is concerned. So just to give you a quick look at that Cold War map, uh, when these things um, are coming to a head, red, we see the Soviet Union. Important to remember, we see that big uh, orange chunk, China, Again, a communist country not aligned with the USSR. So a lot of folks you know, assume that all democracies are aligned with each other. So all communist nations must be aligned with each other and they are not. Uh, Soviet uh, Union and China are not aligned at this time. But we see the Soviet influence in those uh, nations. Again, when we look at the Middle East and the United States and the Soviet's um, sphere of influence, we see all of that right there coming to a head, that pink and that blue. Um, on, on the uh, eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. So go ahead and move on. So as mentioned, energy crisis is sparked by the Arab oil embargo of 1973. Um, and this is a time when the Na United Nations population had increased 71% in the last uh, 30 years. Our, our real gross domestic product increased by over 500%. And these many of these things are thanks to cheap imported oil, um, also refined products, something that we uh, don't do a lot of here at home in the United States. And at that time, we were importing about 25% of OPEC oil, so not just 25% of ours, but 25% of theirs. Uh, so that just uh, gives you an idea how dependent we were, why it was so consequential for us 
uh, when they cut that oil off. Our uh, oil prices went up by 350%. And there's really no segment of society that can escape that. I think we're all uh, have been feeling that in recent months when we've had gas prices go up sharply, not quite 350%. Uh, but we can only imagine um, gas that fuels industry, fuels transportation. Um, and then when cuts have to be made, typically it's going to be with jobs. Uh, that causes um, a pause in wages going up. So we have inflation. Uh, we have low unemployment, or I'm sorry, high unemployment. That comes to be known as stagflation. So this is really something driving the United States to have a role in the Middle East peace process. Because... From uh, Carter's, well, technically from Nixon's standpoint, from Gerald Ford's standpoint, from Jimmy Carter's standpoint, um, this is affecting our economy um, here in the United States. So something needs to be done. And if we can stabilize the conflicts there, we can stabilize energy markets around the world. So going into that, just a reminder from a civics point of view, uh, why it is that Jimmy Carter is at Camp David uh, in 1978 uh, and meeting with uh, foreign leaders, because this constitution tells them that's how their job is carried out, uh, that they can make treaties provided two thirds of the senators uh, concur. So that's two thirds of the U.S. Senate, 100 people, 67 votes needed, checks and balances, making sure not, uh, no single branch of the government has more power than the other. Uh, and they are the ones that had the power to appoint their ambassadors. So those are the players at the table um, at Camp David are people that Jimmy Carter has appointed to their positions um, with the power vested in him by the Constitution. And it also tells him that he's the person to receive ambassadors and other public ministers, uh, as we see happening with Menachem Begin there outside of the White House. So I hinted that this is something, the Camp David, of course, was something built across um, multiple administrations. So these, this does not just come out of nowhere when Jimmy Carter was president. Um, and I think it's very important for students to understand that there's seldom few things any president in office does without some connection to their uh, predecessors and without leaving an impression on their successors. Um, so we see in 1971 that Egypt, they're really basically in the Soviet Union sphere of influence. They have a lot of Soviet military advisors, personnel, receives arm assistance. Their economy uh, is, is more towards a controlled market. Uh, so, uh, Richard Nixon begins thawing that relation. Uh, he and Soviet Premier Brezhnev do sign the uh, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty or SALT treaties as they come to be known. But this has a consequence of the Soviet Union not meeting its pr uh, prior obligations of arm assistance to Egypt. Uh, that rubs Mr. Sadat the wrong way. Uh, Mr. Sadat uh, expels all Soviet uh, per uh, personnel in his country he then starts moving their economy towards a free market system. Uh, 1974, Nixon's successor, Gerald Ford, who we see here in the photograph, uh, sharing a pipe and some laughs with President Sadat, he builds on that relationship. We can see from this photograph, they seem to have a pretty good rapport with each other. Uh, the Arab oil embargo is lifted at that time. And while we do see some relief on energy prices, they don't really roll back to where they were. Uh, this is very early in globalization. We, things don't, um, the economic impacts don't quite happen as fast as they do uh, today. So that high inflation um, and um, that, that's still happening. The prices are still high stagflation. That does continue into President Carter's administration. Really it continues into the Reagan administration. Uh, but 77 Carter comes to office continues this relationship. But he has to start a new relationship with Menachem Begin, who is coming to office uh, essentially at the same time that he is. So he's a player that the United States presidents have not had a lot of exposure to that they're still figuring out at this point. And that's really who's going to be holding all of the cards at Camp David is Menachem Begin in the state of Israel. Uh, but Carter you know, begins his very uh, personal brand of diplomacy that we can get just one uh, insight here from this one letter here to Sadat. Uh, but what I notice when I look at this, you know, not dictated, not typed out by someone else, Jimmy Carter's own, uh, own handwriting right here on White House stationery. Um, but it's letters like this that uh, 
convince Anwar Sadat to become, at the risk of alienating his Arab allies, of becoming the first Arab leader to visit uh, Israel in the Knesset. And that just sets the stage for Camp David in September uh, of 1978. Uh, but we, just a couple of things to highlight in this letter here. Again, these are two world leaders more or less communicating out of obligations of their positions. But Carter really puts a personal uh, tone to these communications. Um, just looking at, at the concluding uh, paragraphs on the second page, um, uh, when time has come to move forward, your early public endorsement of this is approach is extremely important, vital in advancing all parties to Geneva. This is a personal appeal for your support. My very best wishes to you and your family. Your friend, Jimmy Carter, is not just yours in leadership, not respectfully, not sincerely, but your friend. And Jimmy Carter and Anwar Sadat do form a genuine friendship leading up to the Camp David Accords and afterwards. Presidents, like a lot of students, do have to do homework, believe it or not. And this is what that looks like for a president. I imagine it looks very similar for all presidents. Uh, although Carter gets his in an analog form, maybe today it's perhaps they're uh, often born digitally with the internet and what have you. Uh, but this is what it looks like. Uh, again, uh, someone he appointed to office, um, Zygmiew Brzezinski, his national security advisor, has prepared this report highlighting the important parts for his boss. Um, but this is basically telling Carter the things he needs to be discussing with Menachem Begin, the things he needs to know about Menachem Begin before talking uh, with him. We see on that first page and underline really a big part the Camp David Accords um, is, is Egypt, more or less speaking on behalf of their all their Arab allies, uh, wanting a commitment to withdraw from all occupied territories on behalf um, by Israel. And that's really going to be a sticking point um, in the days to come. Uh, you'll see I have a link there for President Carter and the role of intelligence in the Camp David Accords. That's a great link to follow. We actually have a lot of declassified um, CIA documents there. That's a really cool thing to check out, to re read something that you know at some point in time uh, might have gotten you in a lot of trouble if your eyes were looking at it, but now it's out there for the world to see. That's really uh, fun to discover those things and to learn from them and, and be inspired to do further research. And talking about checks and balances, as we mentioned, the Constitution requires that any treaty a president makes with another nation be ratified by the Senate with a two thirds majority vote. Here is the US Senate telling Jimmy Carter how they get his support. They're pro basically providing him with a blueprint, um, but also has a big catch in it. So we see these great things in the first page. Um, no alteration of our historic commitment to the secure the security of Israel. Um, commit to a genuine peace, uh, normalized relations between the countries, uh, mutually accepted and secure borders, um, a fair and permanent solution to the problem of the Palestinians in a way that will co contribute to a lasting peace. But here's the catch in that last paragraph before those signatures, that the United States does not intend to present the nations involved with a plan or a timetable. Peace can only come from a genuine recognition by all the states that their interests are served by reconciliation and not by war. And then we see the uh, Senator's signatures endorsing uh, this approach. Um, so this is basically what Carter has to keep in mind when he goes to Camp David, um, that he's there more or less as a referee or an arbitrator here to uh, guide these other two parties towards peace, but not to uh, recommend or try to impose uh, a plan from the United States. And that's going to be tricky for Jimmy Carter to do. Uh, we can get an idea of um, sentiment in the country at the time. Uh, I think like a source here we have is a political cartoon, a little graphic in some areas there, um, using the theme of summer camp at Camp David, showing Carter, uh, Begin, Sadat, uh, more or less um, with, the, with those two antagonizing each other, Carter in the middle. And it's, you will see it a little bit later. We, you know, we have photographs which almost bring that to life. Carter in between these two, um, trying to keep peace, trying to make progress with them. Uh, but again, a lot of things happening, not just the, the we have the energy crisis happening. Carter's thinking about 
um, re-election campaign. Again, the stagflation is happening. Uh, other things coming up like <laughs> the Iran hostage crisis um, in between here and the final implementation of, of the treaty. So a lot of things are coming to head here. And it's very hard for the American people to connect peace in the Middle East with rising costs at home, with, uh, with losing their job. Uh, we have to put ourselves back into the 70s. Everything is analog unless you're getting the newspaper, um, spending you know a couple hours reading it or watching the news every night, um, which may have you know the one hour of news, you weren't you didn't understand everything that was happening all over the world. You know, I can remember a time in my childhood in the you know in the 90s when you asked someone about politics, probably 90% of people would tell you they didn't watch the news or they didn't read the news. And now we know the news comes and finds you uh, whether you like it or not, but a different time. So I think this is really capturing the sentiment of, of Americans being apprehensive of why are we doing this? Why are we wasting time trying to get these two countries to stop fighting each other? So Carter's carrying that in and thinking about it this way as well, these are outwardly facing, seem to be foreign policies but they really are having an inextricable effect on domestic policy at home. Um, so we he see a cabinet meeting of Jimmy Carter there, again, stressing the importance of um, the civic uh, aspect here of presidents having full cabinet meetings. And a pres presidential cabinets have evolved as our nation has evolved, they become more complex. As a nation becomes more complex, the cabinet uh, has to become more complex. But again, this is just one example of why all of these people have to meet together regularly because they're all inextricably linked, whether pertaining to domestic programs or, uh, or foreign programs. So here we have a map from uh, one of Carter's books uh, showing a layout of Camp David, which is maybe about, uh, I'd say about 30, 40 minutes from Washington DC as the crow flies. Uh, there's a national park site there known as Catoctin Mountain. Uh, recreation area. Basically, there is a buffer for Camp David. Um, but, you know, if you really have some time, I think it's, it's great to cross-reference Jimmy Carter's diaries uh, from these 13 days, because uh, we do have those available on our website. You will see an entry for just about every day of Carter's administration from 1977 through 1981, maybe with the exception of his last week in office. I think we're missing something for the last four or five days, and that was when there was very intense uh, negotiations with the Iran hostage crisis. Um, but this is a great way to cross-reference, see where um, Carter set up various people in, in their respective entourages of Egypt and Israel. Uh, and when you read these diary entries, it tells you President Carter speaks with this person or speaks with that person. And you see like where the path is going, how they're crisscrossing around uh, the area. I think that's very interesting. Um, to examine and it does reveal a, a little bit about how he's trying to bring everyone together at, who's at the table here. There is what one of those daily diary entries look like. This is from the first day, uh, September 5th. Really not a whole lot going on. Everybody's just arriving as we see Menachem Begin doing there. President Carter showing him around the grounds. Later on, President Sadat will also arrive. More or less everyone arrives gets a quick tour, goes back to their cabins, it gets ready for the next day. And so in the next two days, this is when uh, Carter really starts digging in with Sadat and Begin, more or less trying to rewind the consequences of the Six Day War in 1967. So on the left, uh, we see before that, on the right, we see afterwards, and this is when uh, Israeli forces are occupying the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, um, the Golan Heights. Uh, we see that on the right in those, those gray areas there. Um, also Gaza Strip as well. Um, and, you know, this is, again, Menachem Begin's holding the cards here. It's Israel who has to make the concessions for us to find, us, you know, success. Uh, and Menachem Begin, someone who, when he's campaigning for prime minister, he's telling everyone, don't worry, we're not giving up anything. Uh, I'm going to retire in an Israeli settlement on the Sinai Peninsula. So it's not going anywhere. Um, so th this is a tough sell for Carter um, and Sadat. And it and more or less is why uh, Begin 
um, you know, would, would say that he felt cornered by the two, that it was them ag against him, um, that Carter and Stott do have an established relationship. And again, it's them trying to convince the person holding the cards, you know, to make some choices. Now with UN resolution 22 passed in 1967 in response to the six day war, there's specific language. Um, and we find this throughout history with words that are chosen <laughs> that make a big deal. Um, so the language that we're seeing here is withdrawal of Israel armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. Begin interprets this as withdrawal from maybe one, maybe more, but maybe just one. Uh, it does not say from all territories. And Carter Sadat keep coming back to this. Begin also comes back to this they're butting heads, not a lot is getting done, not a lot of progress is being made. Uh, we look at the photograph on the right, this is a meeting between all of them in Carter's office at Camp David. This, you see day three here. Uh, what is happening in this photograph is Anwar Sadat has just aired the grievances of Egypt against Israel for about an hour and 15 minutes. Menachem Begin is now responding <laughs> to those grievances and we can see our referee in the middle, Jimmy Carter is trying to keep a positive face on all of this. And so again, we see that cartoon from earlier, Carter getting roasted between the two, literally <laughs> playing out in real life over here. And so it's at this point, Carter realizes these two together head to head are just, are gonna just continue arguing, disagreeing. Uh, the passions are gonna run too high to, to stop and catch a breath to contemplate any kind of compromise. So he decides, and they agree, that all meetings um, will be separate, that he will not meet with them two in the room at the same time going forward. It'll be him and Begin or him and Sadat. Um, they can meet with members of the delegations, but the two leaders will not be in the same room together at the same time. And that might be key uh, going forward. So we get to the fourth day, Carter's implementing this new approach. Uh, and here's where he takes a big calculated risk. When we remember the senators expressing their support and their conditions for it, um, Carter is putting forth a U.S. proposal for peace because he, he is not confident that Begin and Sadat can work it out themselves. So he is reneging on what he has promised those senators. Uh, so it's a huge calculated risk for Carter. And I just I had to include this photograph because I think it really captures the essence of the Camp David, uh, of the summit at Camp David. And that's uh, uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski on the right, Carter's national security advisor, playing a chess uh, game with Menachem Begin on the left. And imagine his position being someone who's trying to, um, you know, butter up this person, bring them to their point of view. Uh, I believe Brzezinski later commented that you know, there may be, he maybe wasn't playing to the best of his ability that day with Menachem Begin because this is someone they're, you know, they're trying uh, to convince the, to come to their side, so to speak. On the sixth day, you know, Carter decides that everybody needs a break. Uh, Gettysburg National Military Park, uh, site of the largest um, battle in the Western Hemisphere in human history isn't too far away, maybe about 45 minutes to an hour from where Camp David is. Um, this is a battle that had basically the number of casualties of the 12 year war of Vietnam uh, in just three days of July of 1863. Um, so we see them there on the battlefield. Carter's hoping that reminders of that kind, that level of carnage uh, is what awaits these two if they do not get their, uh, set their differences aside and come to an agreement. Um, in case anyone is out there uh, looking for lesson plans, on the Civil War or Reconstruction, the National Archives has you covered there. I have a link there. Please do check that out uh, after the presentation. The next four days, again, just ne intense negotiations. I encourage everyone to look at those daily diary entries um, to see exactly what it is Jimmy Carter is doing on those days. But basically, everyone's deadlocked. Again, over that language of the UN 242 resolution, um, about how to proceed um, in regards to the, the Palestinian situation about uh, the Sinai Peninsula. Just there's no success on any front. Uh, Anwar Sadat is, is really uh, frustrated at this point. 
Carter receives word that his bags are packed and sitting on the porch of his cabin, that he intends to leave these negotiations because he's had it with Menachem Begin. Uh, Carter intervenes. He has what he uh, calls the most uncomfortable conversation of his life uh, and convinces Anwar Sadat to stay. Um, I had a, a very exclusive privilege to um, uh, speak with President Carter on one occasion and ask him why that was the most uncomfortable conversation of his life. Uh, essentially, what he told me was that it wasn't so much that he had to th uh, threaten a another world leader um, with revoking support from the United States, but it was the fact that this world leader just happened to be a very good, genuine friend of his, and he had to go threaten his friend. And uh, I think it's the fact that he told Amr Sadat that their friendship would be off the table if he left uh, is what kept him at those negotiations. So Carter really seems to be the person uh, for, for the time and place. Perhaps if Ford had won the 76 election, we could we would also be at this stage. We did see that he had a great rapport with uh, Amr Sadat. Uh, but Jimmy Carter really seems to be the person to fit that moment, to be up to that moment. So we're drawing to the end of it, of days 11 and 12. Just go ahead and, you know, I'll read the letter out loud, but anyone, you can also read it along as I go. But just try to think about what the tone is of this letter and what conclusions you can draw. So this is Carter writing on the evening of September 15th uh, to both Sadat and Begin that we are approaching the final stage of our negotiations. With your approval, I propose that today we receive your most constructive recommendations, that tomorrow, Saturday, be devoted to drafting efforts and that we conclude the meeting at Camp David at some time during the following day, which would be Sunday. Uh, we will at that time issue a common statement to the press drafted together. Additionally, we should agree not to make any further public statements prior to noon on Monday. Please let me know if you object to any of these proposals. JC, Jimmy Carter. Um, so when I read that, that does not sound like there has been success. That sounds like we've been here for almost two weeks. We have little, if nothing, to show for it. We all need to get on the same page to put some lipstick on this pig, more for lack of a better phrase. And that's why I think, uh, that's what I get out of reading that, what, what Jimmy Carter is impressing upon his uh, his counterparts there. And again, I would uh, implore folks to check out his daily diary from that day. Maybe look for some uh, some corresponding uh, information that maybe gives you further uh, hints about how things are going. So that we're at the final day, day 13, a race to the finish. I thought that was an appropriate picture on the right, Jimmy Carter's bike uh, from Camp David. We do actually uh, have that in our collection here at the Jimmy Carter Library. Um, I think that's how he gets around to a lot of the cabins of people he's talking to. Maybe you'll make that connection. You see the, the times and where Jimmy Carter's zigzagging around. That might be how he's doing it. Um, but this is just the first page of his diary that day. Um, it ends up being four pages. Uh, typically, most entries are two. This day's entry is four. He talks with a lot of people. We see the list just beginning on the page there. But there's you know, really a, a particular one. And I, it's, there's really no context to know how important it is. Um, but that would be, I think, when he talks with Mrs. Clow. Uh, we first see that mentioned there at 745. And that's Carter's personal secretary. But, so I would just say that I know from looking at these, it's very hard to tell what may, what, what, where the breakthrough is. Uh, we just see that it's very intense and a lot of different conversations happening. Um, but we see a res the end of the day here. There's Carter gifting Menachem Begin with uh, photographs from the summit inscribed personally to his eight grandchildren. Um, and we see his reaction there. And whatever it was about these, this is when Begin decides, okay, I, let's look at your plan that the United States has put forward. Um, I think I can give it some more serious uh, consideration. Just to cross reference that, we have a clip of Carter here in 2014, uh, speaking at the uh, LBJ Foundation, uh, talking about 
that breakthrough moment, which really wasn't evident from the other primary sources that we're able to look at. The last day was a turning point because we thought we had failed. And we were getting ready to leave Camp David in failure and go back to Washington and announce that we had not been successful. And Prime Minister Begin asked me if, if I would sign a photograph for his eight grandchildren of me and Begin and Sadat. And I agreed to do it. And my secretary, whose name was Susan Clough, uh, got the names of Begin's eight grandchildren from e Israel. She called over there and got their names. So instead of saying, best wishes, Jimmy Carter, I said, with love and best wishes, too. And I put down his grandchild's name, and I signed it. And I took it over to his cabin to tell him goodbye. And, uh, and uh, when he opened the door, he was very angry with me. And he said, good afternoon, Mr. President. It was always very proper. And I said, good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. And I'm sorry we hadn't been successful. I brought the photographs you asked for, and I gave, it to, gave the photographs to him. And he uh, turned around and said, thank you, sir. And then he looked down at the photographs. And he read out loud, love and best wishes to, and said, he read his grandchild's name. And he... Uh, put that over in the back and he read the next one's name and he read the third one's name and his chin began to quiver and tears ran down his cheeks and mine too. And uh, he said in effect, why don't we try one more time? Okay. So there we heard it directly from President Carter that this gift, uh, this personal very personal gift, uh, really make, uh, provides us with a breakthrough emotionally with Menachem Begin and seeing that was what it took to get him to the table to take their considerations uh, seriously. The last. So what we do get at Camp David is a framework for peace in the Middle East. And you'll see I have a hyperlink there to our uh, the Carter Library website uh, that gives you the text of that framework. So this is more or less the preliminary agreement they agree on at the summit that has to be taken back to their respective countries and approved. Again, in Jimmy Carter's case by 67 of 100 US senators. What we end up with is the framework for the conclusion of a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. So that is what is approved. Uh, and that is still intact more than 40 years later. Uh, but again, the big takeaways here, normalization of relations between Egypt and Israel, uh, return of the Sinai Peninsula from Israel to Egypt. Um, but what we do not get is an agreement on between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, sadly, that is something that, that eludes Carter at Camp David. Uh, other presidents like President Clinton, who we see here meeting Carter in his earlier years, uh, he takes up that mantle during his presidency, um, but, is all, but is also unsuccessful um, in that regard. And I think we all know that we continue to have conflict uh, in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, um, and with Israel uh, today because of the um, failure to secure that agreement at this summit. So if, the, if you're looking to uh, dig in a little bit deeper, again, in addition to the presentation I can make available um, to anybody, uh, some more student teacher resources on our website, the Camp David Accords is under our uh, frequently requested topics on the research tab. We have a lot of resources there, 25 um, documents, 25 photographs, again, um, the role of intelligence, the Camp David Accords. Uh, for lesson plans uh, within the President's Travels and our Teacher Resources page, Unit 10 covers the Camp David Accords. We also have original uh, AP US history um, document-based exercises uh, for middle and high schoolers on the Camp David Accords. National Archives has various educator resources available, uh, particularly um, document analysis worksheets, which are really great for students to use. Uh, we also have a great website called Docs Teach, which is kind of like, uh, I, you know, a simpler National Archives catalog, I would say, more student um, oriented, but again, also for teachers, because we do have lesson plans and activities with national, um, 
with resources of the National Archives contained in them at your fingertips. Uh, Jimmy Carter has written a lot of books since he got out of office, more than 30, uh, some of them about the P Middle East peace process. We have those listed here. And there's a great video on the framework for peace. Um, and that's a National Archives video, a little long, I believe it's um, about an hour long. Uh, but again, if you're really interested, something I recommend uh, checking out. And on that note, I would say shalom, y'all, <laughs> with this great picture we have <laughs> from our collection. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So Joshua, wonderful job uh, as always. Oh, sorry to interrupt you, Joshua. Can you hear me? Not a problem. I right, can. Great. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, so thanks so much. Uh, wonderful job as always. Uh, and just to clarify, uh, how can folks get their hand on um, your slides so that they can access those hyperlinks? Is oh, that okay, something so what, you can send me or? Yes, absolutely. I'll send you a, a, a PDF of that. Uh, mm -hmm. All the hyperlinks will be active. Um, that slide with the video clip we showed, I, I have a link to that in the text. I don't, the link won't be active on the picture, but mm -hmm. it will be there to the left. So I can give that to you and you can distribute to, to the guest list. Yeah, that would be great, Joshua. That sounds perfect. So that answers a couple of questions right there. Uh, Wendy wants to know, uh, did President Carter have special negotiation skills by training or did they come to him naturally? Well, you know, from a very early age, he's a very um, motivated entrepreneurial uh, person. You know, he's uh, making money with his own personal businesses as a kid. Uh, he's a very avid reader as a kid. He reads War and Peace uh, in elementary school. He thinks it's about um, you know, cowboys and Indians, as the phrase was back then. A little, little deeper. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, he uh, always wants to go uh, get into the uh, United States Navy after his uh, Uncle Buddy. Uh, he gets into the United States Naval Academy. Uh, following that, he attends submarine school. And that's where I think he gets a lot of leadership. Uh, because he is, he's not a nuclear physicist, but he's a, more like a nuclear mechanic. So he's in the program of designing nuclear propulsion um, engines for the Navy submarines. He comes to command one of the first two nuclear submarines. He's also assigned to the cleanup of the first nuclear meltdown in human history uh, at Chalk River Laboratories in Canada in 1952. So he led about a team of 23 people there. Uh, to disassemble and uh, repair and, and put back together a, a nuclear engine at that plant, which they are successful in, in doing. Um, although President Carter said he tested positive for radiation about six months after that. And I think in 90, the 90 second increments they were working in, he withstood about an hour's, uh, I'm sorry, a year's worth of uh, radiation by today's thresholds. Um, but I think it was that work and his commander, uh, a man named Admiral Rickover, uh, who was uh, relentless, as Carter uh, puts it in one of many ways, uh, who really inst instilled discipline and leadership in Carter. Um, but he also, you know, has that the human rights side to him as well, growing up in the rural South, um, seeing segregation as a child, uh, seeing poverty around them. And, you know, while the Carters themselves weren't poor, um, but he, he, he's definitely uh, privy to it. Uh, all around in, in southwestern Georgia. So I think all of those things, you know, together, I think really set the stage for him to be a good negotiator. Sure. And then also being so, in the, his, his private life is um, mm -hmm. uh, with the peanut, bit, peanut farm business and distri distribution business. You know, when he can't, he, th that's what he leaves the military for is to run that business after his father dies. Mm -hmm. He soon discovers it's you know, not as easy as he thought. He has to really build strong community bonds. You know, he does that working with Future Farmers of America. He's also uh, involved in things like his local school board, the local library board. Uh, he then joins the Lions Club. Uh, he's quoted as saying if he hadn't joined the Lions Club, he would have never had the confidence and resources to run for governor of Georgia, let alone president of the United States. Um, so just, yeah, all those networking skills, whether it's from his military career, entrepreneurial career, um, you know, they, they all just really holistically came together at Camp David, I believe. Oh, very good. 
Uh, so if, if anyone else has any questions for Joshua, now's the time. Uh, Diane says, thank you for this excellent and interesting presentation. Maddie says, very interesting and informative presentation. I learned so much more on the subject. Thank you so much. Uh, Joshua, uh, not to spot you, but um, you know, if I wanted to learn more about Jimmy Carter, do you have one book in particular that you would recommend and or one documentary that you would point me to? Okay, so a, a good one, to, if you're looking for a all around um, a story of Carter, uh, I think one, one of his more recent books called A Full Life Reflections at 90 mm. is a very good book. And in that book, there is, that's the mention of what I brought up in my program about him saying that conversation with Omar Sadat was the most difficult of his life. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's how I knew to ask him that question when I had the opportunity in, in an audience with him. But yeah. so I think that's the best one to get the whole story. <laughs> Although he's done, he did quite a bit between 90 and, and, his, and now. Uh, he and Rosalind have you know, been relatively inactive in, in Plains, Georgia. They're in their late 90s now. Uh, the Carter Center, their nonprofit, has been handed over to the grandson, Jason Carter. Um, so he, they're finally re enjoying the retirement <laughs> in their late 90s now. A, a well but there was a good bit. Yeah, there was still a good bit, though, between 90 and I'd say the time he was 95, 96. But I think you can get the most out of, out of that book, um, ref uh, Reflections of a Life in Nine. Uh, yeah, Pat I notes that I, I, it, it, I got it right the first time I said it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Pat says it would also appear that his religious upbringing may have played a part uh, in his success. And uh, Vivian asks, uh, were both Begin and, and Sadat later assassinated in their home countries? So Menachem Begin was not, but Amar Sadat, yes, was assassinated about one year after the conclusion of the Camp David. Um, Accords. Uh, he was um, observing a military parade in the stands. Um, a soldier exited the formation as they were going past and opened fire on the stands. Um, you, you can't actually find footage of it online. You know, we, again, take that with some discretion. Uh, but yes, unfortunately, he does pay that price for making peace uh, with Israel. He's still the only Arab leader to visit the Knesset, Israel's legislative body, uh, to this day. Uh, last question goes to Barbara. Do you think the presentation of the signed picture made the need for resolution on a more human scale and helped with a solution? I, do, I believe so. Um, you know, at, at one event that I was staffing when President Carter had made an appearance, um, I recall him saying, talking about this, this um, story, and him mentioning that he said to Menachem Begin, I had hoped to sign these, this is when me and your grandfather made peace. So it seems he did put a little bit of uh, <laughs> guilt on, on Menachem Begin in that, during that exchange. And it, and it really seemed to do the trick and hit home with Begin that that was what was at stake, not their interest now, not his retiring in a uh, Israeli settlement on the Sinai Peninsula, but would his grandchildren have to be at this negotiation table? Would his grandchildren you know, be dying at the hands of an Egyptian soldier? Would they, and vice versa? Um, so I, I really think that Carter you know, really hit a home run with that one. And again, as I mentioned in that daily diary of all those people he's meeting with, <laughs> who would ever know it's that Miss Clow <laughs> was the important contact uh, in that day because she was the one getting the names of these kids and making sure these photographs um, got to Carter so he could get them signed and, and over the big and yeah, good point. Um, so I think uh, we're coming up on three o'clock, Joshua. So I think we're going to um, leave it there and let folks get uh, get on to the World Cup. Uh, but I want to thank you so, so much. Uh, wonderful job as always. I think this was your third time presenting to us. You always do a great job. Uh, folks uh, watching live, uh, look for an email from me either later today or tomorrow uh, with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, um, hopefully um, the uh, slideshow, the slides, mm -hmm. and uh, information about some other upcoming virtual programs that may be of interest. Uh, we're uh, Zooming with Jeffrey Urban from the FDR Library, um, if not next Tuesday, the following Tuesday, and a lot of other fun things coming up as well. So Joshua, thank you so, so much, and I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Happy holidays and go uh, Team USA. Absolutely. Care, Have everyone. a good one. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.